Um, I proudly present to you Ari Wilschut from Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Uh, last time we wanted to have him here, he had a grave injury, so he didn't, uh, wasn't able to be here with us. So we are, I'm very glad that today we, we can have his lecture about time which I think is the, the focus of our work in history, something specific to our domain. So to present I Wilshut, uh, he studied history, um, uh, medieval history, and, um, and also art history in Amsterdam. And then he worked as a teacher in secondary school for 14 years. So he knows what happens in our schools on, and what is history education in, from the practice. Then he wrote his promotion, his PhD, in 2010. That, uh, that book I read with great interest um, it called Images of Time. It's uh, translated to, uh, to English so we can all read it without problems. I would rather ha would have problems with, with, with Dutch, I think. <laughs> so then he um, uh, started after his um, PhD as a lecturer in history education in Amsterdam, and he is now in the center of applied research in education. So what he will tell us this evening is something in theory, but he also worked in <laughs> studies about his historical education history education. He uh, 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 wrote several textbooks for secondary school and um, as a secretary of the Commission of History and Social Sciences, he was responsible with others um, on this 10-era system for Dutch history education, which sounds very interesting. Uh, 10 eras. So... Uh, Another day we could discuss that too. Yeah, I would say uh, I'm not going to tell anything about that, but if people want to ask questions, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that's fine. Um, the magic number 10. Yes, because we have 10 fingers. <laughs> yeah, we. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he founded the Netherlands Institute for Teaching and Learning History, and in this uh, context, he, he wrote a, a text on um, history education in universities teaching students, uh, but I think that book isn't translated to, to English, so that's a pity. We could uh, um, improve our, our lecture with that book, I think. Only to name three publications with uh, Linda Sing Singcox, he oh. published National History Standards. We are discussing those problems in Germany too, that those are the standards in historical education. Some people reject those standards, technically, others not. And you, in, in 2012, Images of Time, I've already spoken about that interesting book, and in 2015 with Arthur Chapman, um, a joint up history, uh, new directions in history education research. I think that's more empirical, that book, I yeah, think. But it's a collection of history. Yeah. So okay. if you want to read something, all those books are um, interesting for history. So I'm very um, interested in your presentation about history, historical thinking, time, and democracy, as I read in the article. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. I want to thank you for that I can Deutsch speak today. My Deutsch is not, not good in, not good enough, <laughs> not good enough. Uh, I, w I like to talk freely. That's the reason. I mean, I, when I when I would have chosen German, I, I would have had a text here and started reading, like many German professors are also used to do. But anyway, I don't like to do that. So uh, to be able to talk freely, I I have to use uh, English. But if you want to ask questions afterwards in the discussion. Uh, feel free to speak German because I can understand what you say and I will then reply 
in English, if you allow me. Um, as Jörg already said, uh, it is my job now to teach teaching history at this Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences. Uh, I teach, uh, at this time, I teach only the advanced teachers, the teachers that are already teachers but want to, you know, go on for their uh, advanced degrees. And uh, this is a very inspiring uh, <coughs> job, actually, because people who are experienced teachers ask different kind of questions and are more interested in, in the more... Um, the more the deep the deeper principles of uh, history and didactics so that is interesting to do and I also do research I also do um, the, the supervision of PhD research I have done several PhD research uh, has have been completed under my supervision and that has also resulted in quite a few. Uh, interesting uh, texts that you might read, but they are not in books, they are in articles uh, in international journals. So that's a bit uh, of an introduction on what I do. What I'm going to uh, present to you tonight is something that I have been interested in for a long time, <coughs> and uh, it has also been, uh, as uh, Jörg already uh, explained, uh, a part of uh, my uh, my own PhD study, which has been translated as <laughs> Images of Time. I start off to, to show you uh, the contents of the lesson, <laughs> which is always easy. <laughs> it has uh, ten chapters, as you see. I like ten. <laughs> <laughs> ten, <laughs> ten chapters. Uh, so I, I will start off uh, with one slide to, to make the... the uh, the, the statement that time is pivotal to history, time, uh, time is the es essence of history. That's the first thing. Then I will uh, start on uh, time and human imagination. This is about how people imagine time. This is the second part. So how do people think about time? What kind of images of time do they develop spontaneously? That's the third thing, spontaneous images of time. And then I will confront the spontaneous images, the ones that come to us without study, that, that, that originate naturally. I will confront those to historical images of time. And this is one of the main uh, points of this lecture, that this thinking historically about time is something that doesn't come naturally to people. It is something that has to be cultivated. It has to be. It's the result of of conscious study. So that's an important thing. The the, the, the fourth uh, chapter. And then the second important thing is that I will connect those historical images of time to uh, democratic thinking. So those are actually the two the two backbones of the whole story. And, and of course you can also be critical of them because perhaps you don't agree that you think it's, it's not the right way to think about it. Well, in that case I will welcome your criticisms, but this four and five are very important. <coughs> then I will start a search in six and seven on what actually are the specifics of historical thinking about time. What are the essential concepts that are uh, constitutive of historical thinking about time. And then I will turn to uh, a more, the more didactical uh, part of the talk, because I will then try to explore why these six concepts are so unnatural and why they are so difficult to learn. Um, that is also based on didactical research. Um, and then I will make the point that while they are difficult to learn, it is still necessary to do it because there are such important possible yields, possible results of that kind of thinking that are important for a democratic society. And that is actually a, a hypothetical part that is in this ninth part. And you might agree or you might not agree. And there's, if, if, that, if there is some let's say, workable truth in there, it should have to be still confirmed by empirical research. Uh, you, you can see it says possible yields, but 
whether these yields are really there has not yet been proven, but could be proven by <coughs> empirical research in, in the future. And then the research conclusion. Okay, I will start off with this first uh, time is pivotal to history, and I will try that to well, I show that to you in a few quotes by famous people, and I think that's maybe not uh, a lot is necessary to stress the fact that time is indeed pivotal to history. Uh, Anke Smith is a very well-known Dutch philosopher of history. He's also published internationally quite a lot. Uh, unlike social sciences, time, temporal distance is constitutive of practice of history. It's a very easy one. Jordanova is a British uh, theoretician. History is a systematic, systematic study of the past and at its heart is time. And of course you know who Rusen is. He is a German uh, philosopher of history and a very famous person in Germany but also outside Germany. And of course his quote is longer than the other two <laughs> because that's what German people do. <laughs> Geschichte lernen ist ein Vorgang des menschlichen Bewusstseins in dem bestimmte Zeiterfahrungen, there we are, the Zeiterfahrungen, deutet, angeeignet werden und dabei zugleich die Kompetenz zu dieser Deutung entsteht und sich weiterentwickelt. Well, that reason, the reason philosophy is, of course, much more extensive, and, but he puts time also very central to what he thinks is actually history, and he, therefore he makes this connection between uh, experiences from the past, observations on the present, and expectations for the future and how they are interconnected. I will come back to that later. So there could, of course, be said a lot more about this, but I hope that this is, for the time being, enough to say, like, let's say, okay, time is indeed a very central issue if we are talking about this history. Experience of time is pivotal to history. And I put experience of um, in front of that on purpose, because that's, that is important. The second one, time and human imagination. Why do we have to connect time to human imagination? One of, one of the first thinkers about time, it might be surprising to you, I don't know, but it's actually Augustinus, St. Augustine, uh, the famous Christian philosopher from antiquity, and when he was writing a comment on the Bible in general, he was reflecting on the, uh, the Genesis uh, part of the Bible, and then, of course, reflecting on what is time and what's eternity. And actually, how does, how does time differ from eternity? That's actually his, his question. And so he started to reflect on what actually is time. And then he came with that very famous quote, the quote on which is on top there, what then is time? When nobody asks me, I know. But if I wish to explain it to someone that asks, I do not know. So I know what time is as long as I don't have to explain it. And as once you start, once someone forces you to explain what is actually time, you will not be able to do that. That's a difficult thing. But on the other hand, it is difficult to explain it is perhaps even non-existent, that will be on the next slide. But on the other hand, it's also a necessary precondition to our existence. We cannot do otherwise but imagine that there is something like time. Although that is very difficult. How can there be a past if it doesn't exist anymore? That's one of the questions that Augustine asked himself. The past is actually not real. The past is not real as much as the future is not real. You have to try to imagine that for a few seconds. The past is actually non-existent. It's only something that we imagine that has been the case years ago. How can there be a future <coughs> if it doesn't yet exist? So past and future is, are the things that form our thinking, but at the same time, he realizes that while past and future are essential to our thinking, both of them are not there, which makes it, makes it a very complicated, complicated situation. And this is probably the reason why 
it is so difficult to define what time is. There are people, there are theoreticians, philosophers, physicists, who claim that time really doesn't exist. This is a fascinating book. I haven't completed reading all of it because he is a theoretical physicist and that is difficult. Sort of Einstein uh, theory. <laughs> but uh, his conclusion is that time really doesn't exist. Uh, this Julian Barber says time is, is non-existent. It is, a, it is something that people have introduced into their model of thinking about reality, also in physics, to be able to make uh, the laws of physics, physics match. But it's just a theoretical conception. I mean, someone like Newton, for instance, who made those famous laws of Newton, he just posited that there is time. He says, there is time which is uh, something that is moving in, in, in the same uh, tempo uh, and, and it's also without end from the past to the future. But he could not prove that it is there and he could also not describe it. And he, he, uh, someone like Newton also says something like, yeah, time was created by God. That's it. It's, it's, it's a sort of godly phenomenon and we just assume that it is there. Because if we don't assume that, we cannot explain a lot of things in reality. But still, it's also difficult to really prove that it is there. So time might be non-existent. That is not something that I will elaborate very much further. But what is very important is that while it is perhaps non-existent, non -existent, it is also essential to the way we think. And perhaps it is therefore a construction of the human mind. Temporal experiences might be the result of the constitution of the human mind. Our mind is, is shaped like that. So we have to imagine. We cannot function otherwise, but by memories of the past, observations of the present, and expectations for the future. That is the construction of our mind. But it doesn't prove, that doesn't prove that that is corresponding to anything that is real, if you understand what I mean. So we, this is what we call time, right? So we have to just settle for that and say, OK, this is what we call time. And why do I uh, tell you this? This is to tell you that time is not something that is there. It's not something that can be defined by pointing at the clock and say, OK, this is it. It's hours and seconds and whatever. No. Time is something that is experienced by people. People imagine that there is time. And the human imaginations of times are therefore very important to its conceptualization. There hasn't, I haven't seen anywhere in theory any definition of time, any description of time that goes beyond what humans experience. So the human experience is essential to what time is. OK, this is the, the, the deepest kind of theory that I will do tonight. But this is just to, 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 um, to convince you that it is worthwhile to look at these human imaginations, because the human imagination is the only thing that we have. It's the, it's the, only, it's the only way to approach the phenomenon of time. So the phenomenolog phenomenological approach is the most fruitful way of thinking about time. And therefore, I will now go to the third uh, part, which is the spontaneous images of time. What is, what is actually the way people imagine time if, if you do nothing? If you, if you do not have any school, if you do not have any... Uh, studies, any, any systematic uh, shaping of thoughts, what is, what is what happens automatically to people? That's, that's, the, that's the first question. Well, those, uh, that um, uh, question I have been answering by uh, studying quite a few anthropological studies, because you might claim that in non-Western societies, 
where there are no clocks and where there are no uh, uh, studies uh, of history or studies of the past, but just the spontaneous experiences of people. Um, what do they come down to? And it's interesting to see if you look at those non-Western cultures uh, as far apart as, as in Canada or Eastern Africa or Northern Japan or wherever, people seem to think about time in three basic ways, which are very interesting actually to study because they're also very important for us. I will come to that in a minute. And they are the daily cyclic for ecological time, the social, structural, linear time. The, 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 the first one is cyclic, the second one is linear, and the third is the mythical time. Those three come up with a lot of uh, cultures. I will talk about each of them for a minute. The daily cyclic time is connected to the natural phenomenon of days, months, and years, the things that come back all the time. Eh? The 24-hour cycle, the, the monthly cycle, the annual cycle, of course not the weekly cycle, if you understand what I mean. Because the, the weekly cycle has been artificially introduced by humans, <coughs> which is actually interesting to see how much we uh, appreciate that way of thinking about time, because we introduced an extra one, which is the week. But it is concentrating on the things that return. It is cyclic rather than linear. It's focusing on recurring events. And for each of them, I will make the point that they are not specific to non-Western cultures, but they, that they are also very basic for us. Uh, but I have just taken the approach of those anthropological studies to get hold of what kinds of thinking about time they might be, but if you then transfer them to our uh, Western culture, you will see that we actually we also do that. Uh, we also have the weekly rhythm, we also have recurrent annual events, and the interesting thing about them is that they are actually more easy, more natural, more intuitive to use and remember than linear time. Nobody needs a calendar to remind him that Christmas returns every year. You just know it. You know it that that, that, that is true. The weekly rhythm is something that we learn very easily by heart. But if you want to remember time as a long line, it's much more difficult. If you want to re remember time as, as a linear phenomenon, then you start to need calendars and dates and, and, and planning in your agenda, etc. But the the, 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 the the cyclic rhythm is a very basic and very intuitive and easy phenomenon for everyone, and it's also true in our kind of society. I think. Second one, the social structure one, is based on the fact that people uh, live together with different generations, older people, younger people, and that there are different life stages, uh, people who get married, people who get children, people who die, that kind of things. And those moments in time are often connected to uh, a linear image. If people get married, I don't know if they do that also in Germany, but in Holland, yes, then you will get flashbacks on what they were like when they were young, and you know, all these funny pictures, etc. When do you get flashbacks? Well, with an event like that. Or for instance, if a colleague uh, takes leave of uh, his job and goes, uh, is, uh, is retiring, then of course you get the whole story of what happened during uh, his uh, professional career. So we do that every now and then. We have that kind of social time. But we don't have it as often and as as intense as the one that uh, the cyclic uh, weekly rhythm. It is sort of uh, stopping and saying, okay, let's stop here and let's look ahead and, and let's look back and have a sort of linear picture of time. So that one is focusing on singular events and in the 
cultures that I was talking about, the non-Western cultures, it's based on memory and story, of course. Uh, people telling each other their experiences, the experiences of different generations, and therefore the scope is a maximum of three generations. So it's the time that people tell each other from their memories. It's, it's no longer than three generations, maximum 100 years, and then beyond that, there is nothing. The third, the, I'm sorry, this one is also uh, basic for uh, Western societies, and I've already told you this, events like marriages, births, deaths, and anniversaries, memories, flashbacks, reviews. It is less spontaneous than the first one. It's only occurring on special occasions, and the memories may be, of course, distorted, and the length of this time span is limited, limited to Let's say 100 years maximum. The third one is the mythical time, which is actually not really time. It is the, the primeval age when the gods created the earth. It's long ago, but people do not know how long ago it is. It's, it's, it's a, a deep past, a deep mythical past. And actually, it is also not important how long ago it is. It's also not important how long it lasted because it is beyond time in such a way that it's all actually eternal. It is something, it's an eternal reality that started to be created when the earth was created and which comes back all the time in the same way. It's a sort of eternity. So it's focusing on eternal things and on eternal returns. I've been wondering, is this also something that is basic to our society? perhaps less than the other two, but I think it is still, it is still present. For instance, many uh, people who are not very great students of history uh, oppose past and present as if they are binary opposites. Like, they, they will talk about formerly and now, or some, something that used to be the case in the past. How long ago? Don't know, doesn't matter. The past. People also focus then, in that case, on eternal truths. Uh, many people, for instance, are convinced that in the past everything used to be better than now. <coughs> that is, of course, not true, and it's also very undifferentiated. But it is, a, it is a, a, a thing that people say, or anything is uh, much worse than that. Mythical ideas are not the result of deliberate study. They are impressions and convictions that are just taken to be true. Okay, these three, uh, I want to make the point, these three are basic experiences of time that will originate if you do not do anything, if you don't stimulate any study, if you don't uh, study history, if you do not do any conscious study of time, then you will have those three versions. I will now oppose three spontaneous images of time to the historical ones. And I will show you that they are very much opposites, that they are uh, extremes on a, on a continuum. Here are the three uh, spontaneous experiences of time, daily cycling, uh, social structural and mythical. If we oppose that to historical time, then we will see that uh, the daily cycle is cyclic rather than linear. Of course, historical time is linear rather than cyclic. It's, historical time is not focusing on recurring events, but focusing on singular events, events that happen only once. And uh, while the daily cyclic time needs no aids, the historical time does need dates. It needs timelines, it needs chronology, it needs dates. Otherwise, you will just get lost. You will, get, you will lose track of it. So, on those three characteristics, it is, it's an opposite of daily cyclic time. Social structural time is based on memory and story, but historical time is based on careful study of documents. Uh, 
the social structure time has a limited length, but the historical time is unlimited. It can last for centuries, as you know. The social structure time, the third one, is, uh, is something that I will come back to later. But it's an interesting thing that the social structure of time takes a sort of we feeling as a point of departure. We work like this. And this is what we experience. We. That means us and me and my ancestors, my, my great my great grandfathers, that sort of thing. It's a we group. While the historical time sometimes also use, uses the we perspective, but in that case I think they are doing something that is doubtful, but we will talk about that later. Actually, it would be more historical to talk about us and them, to stress the differences between people in the past and people in the present. Uh, historians are interested in those differences, not how people were similar, but how people were different. Mythical time uh, is undefined in length or distance, uh, while well, historical time, of course, is defined in length and distance. It, 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 we know how long ago something is. We, we have a, 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 an exact chronology. Or we know how long periods have lasted, and it's also important to know that, otherwise it's not history. And um, while the mythical thinking focuses on eternal truth and eternal things, Historical thinking focuses on temporary things and changes. So we could assume that this way of thinking is, is opposed to what people do naturally. There are also, uh, so the conclusion would be a historical consciousness of time is fundamentally different from spontaneous temporal experiences. And it does not come naturally to people and must therefore be learned. <laughs> if that last work uh, comes to the fore, then of course it becomes important for us as uh, didactic people because we are talking about learning. So without learning, we don't have historical time. That's something that we could state. And I will uh, support that with a few. Uh, quotes from uh, philosophers. For instance, the British philosopher Unkshot uh, makes a distinction between the practical present past and the present future of practical engagement and the historical past. The, the ones at the top are the sort of spontaneous daily things. What is the, the practical present past is, is something like you know what you have to do if you take uh, if you take the tram, why do you know that? Well, you have learned that in the practical term. Right? It's something that comes to you naturally. Or when you have to cook a, cook a dinner, you also use the practical present past. Because you know how to do that, unless you, unless you are a bad cook, of course. And present future of practical engagement is something like, you know what you have to do the next second. If you want to cross Cross a road, for instance, you have to watch the traffic and then see if everything is safe, and then of course you can go, go ahead and cross the road. That's the present future of practical engagement. And then also says, well, that is something that people always have. That's, that's the spontaneous, normal dealing with time. But it is opposed to the historical past. And he says, it's the historical past is the result of deliberate study. It's difficult to achieve, it's difficult to sustain, it is, it's difficult to, to keep doing it, because it's easily susceptible to relapse into some other engagement. You are, you are very easily diverted from it. If you, if you do not concentrate, you will fall back into your daily habits of dealing with time as you, as you usually do. So that's Oakshot. Uh, another, this is a, this is a Canadian uh, theoretician. He uh, has, I think it is actually the same distinction, but he uses different terms for it. Uh, the pre-thematic pre aware awareness and interest of time, which means, of course, there is some interest in yesterday and tomorrow, but it's, it's not a matter of, of uh, deliberate study. And then, of course, he opposes that to professional historical awareness. 
the third one that I quote is a uh, he's a psychologist. He's, he's a very interesting psychologist. I will I could uh, recommend to to read if you are interested. He has done a lot of empirical research on how people imagine time and how people deal with time, <coughs> not in a historical way, but in the psychological way. And then he says. It's a chronological illusion to think that people imagine time as an abstract, uniform, measurable dimension that stretches indefinitely into the past and the future. So this one, the abstract, uniform, measurable dimension that stretches indefinitely into the past and the future, that's actually, that's the historical time, right? That abstract line that stretches indefinitely. But he says that's not what people do. People do not imagine time like uh, a line like that. That's, that's not what people do spontaneously. They, people have, have, have flashes, have memories, have, like he, he calls it a patchwork, a patchwork of imaginations, which are usually not systematized into one coherent, uh, coherent story. So those are three, but there are, of course, there are, we could quote numerous more people who would also stress the fact that also, Rizinus said the same thing. Uh, all these studies of past, present, future cannot automatically be called historical. Uh, only a few of them are historical. And the historical are those that have certain characteristics. So that was number four. Now I will make the point about uh, democracy. Because if you study uh, when did people start to imagine time in the way I have just described it, in this historical way, this, this long line, this chronological study, then it is actually striking that in the periods when it emerged in European history, they were also the periods in which democracy emerged. If thinking about time in a historical manner is so unnatural, why should we take the trouble to teach it? Well, spontaneous temporal experience sits originate in traditional, closed, and undemocratic societies. They concentrate on eternal truths, in, on tradition, and on returning similarities. But the historical time experience, for the first the first one, actually, the first one arose in Greek antiquity uh, with people like Herodotus and how shall I pronounce him? Shall I pronounce him in the English way or in the German way? Thucydides. 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 They say in But we have been trained to say Thucydides. In, uh, in Greek. Anyway, uh, these people were the first to not imagine time in this mythical, social, and daily, but in the historical way. And I've even read an article about uh, Thucydides, in which he is typified as the theoretician of democracy. And why is there this connection? Because people like Thucydides were trying to look to the human experience as, as, a, as a means to understand the present and to make plans for the future. And people in a democracy live while changing the course of events. And they're also taking part in changing the course of events. And therefore, they start to study uh, the past in a different way. They, don't, they are not interested in the eternal truth or in uh, gods uh, uh, directing history in this or that way, but they just want to know what happened in the past to, to learn for the present and the future. Well, Herodotus and Thucydides are, of course, generally regarded as the fathers of history. And then, of course, the second major emergence of, of history as a Wissenschaft is the one from the 19th century. And is it a coincidence that this also was the century of the emergence of Western democracy? 
I think it is not. I think it's not a coincidence. I think there is a connection there. And therefore I have set myself to exploring what that connection might uh, be. To um, be able to find the specific um, characteristics of, of what historical time actually is, I have uh, turned to the origins of historical thinking about time in, in, in Europe. And there are actually two major developments that can, exp that can be studied in order to find the origins of that historical time. The first major development is the, the revolutions, the democratic and industrial revolutions around 1800, because of the profoundness of changes in a relatively short time span, these revolutions caused a fundamental change in temporal experiences. And the second important uh, <coughs> Event is the late 20th century interested interest in rep representations and narrations. I will not explain that now. I will come back to that. So uh, th those two, uh, I will uh, explain them in a bit more detail. Uh, the first one, the, the enormous change around 1800. Uh, resulted in a different experience of time because people during their own lifetime realized that their world was changing in such a way that there was no connection anymore with anything that happened before. Uh, like uh, the, the German uh, theoretician has made this uh, famous distinction between Erfahrungsraum and Erwartungshorizont. Uh, he says those two were split apart. This sounds very theoretical, so I will try to explain it a little bit more basically. In a traditional society, it is useful to learn from your parents what you have to do in the future. For instance, if your, par if your parents are uh, um, carpenters, <laughs> if your parent is a carpenter, you can look to his practice of good being a carpenter and then try to imitate him and do the same thing and go on. So, so the Erfahrungs around the room of experience, corresponds to anything that you can expect in the future. But because of the very rapid developments, for instance, of the Industrial Revolution, the room of experience did no longer uh, correspond with things that you could expect in the future. So there was, a, the, there was the, the sense, the feeling of a very fundamental breach, of a, a very fundamental feeling of discontinuity uh, in the 19th century. The Dutch philosopher uh, expresses that in a very, I think, in a beautiful way. One has become what one is no longer. So people in, in those 19th century, century modern societies knew that they had become something that that was that uh, that they were not no longer before so there is uh, there is a sense of loss also a sense of uh, something that used to be the case but is no longer true for me and therefore I am not that person anymore uh, or the the British uh, geographer theoretical geographer Lowenthal he has uh, written that beautiful book uh, in the, top, the, the title, The Past is a Foreign Country. It's also that kind of feeling, the past is a foreign, that's also a quote from a, no, a British novel. But anyway, this is a sentence of that book. The past evidently was a foreign country. It contrasts might amuse, shock, or even instruct the present, but could no longer sustain a faith in its exemplary role. It's interesting to know about the past. It could be amusing, it could be shocking, it could, but it has no practical use. The past doesn't have a practical use in the way of, okay, this is what our predecessors this did, and so we have to do the same thing. That's that sense of breach that 
happened around 1800 and which very much promoted the um, emergence of historical science, Geschichtswissenschaft, in the 19th century. A feeling of discontinuity and distance resulting in a sense of anachronism, a very basic concept of historical uh, consciousness of time, being anachronism, meaning periods are fundamentally different. The periods differ from each other. And as uh, Ranke said, jede epoche is unmittelbar zu God. It means no period is only the, the predecessor of another. It's, it's not the prehistory of another period. Now they are they all have an identity of their own right uh, and, and can be studied in their own right, but fundamentally different from each other. The feeling of anachronism makes it a, 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 a basic sin to sort of to confuse different periods with each other. You have you cannot confuse periods with each other. This belongs to A. This belongs to B, this belongs to C. That is a result of the, <coughs> of the discontinuity feeling. The second one is the feeling of historical distance. People in former times were not like us. Of course, they were people, but they were different. They were alien. And then, of course, the problem is how to understand them and how to explain them, which has been theory theorized a lot in German philosophy and history with, the, with this famous concept of Verstehen uh, understand people from the past, but how can you understand people from the past if they are fundamentally different it's a very a very important problem that has kept people busy for a long time and still we do not really understand it I think. but anyway, that's the feeling of distance and the third one is the sense of contingency. Uh, if periods are not just in a, in a logical consecutive order, like this one is the predecessor of that one, and that one is the predecessor of that one, if there, if there is no such line in history, then of course you start wondering, is there perhaps no line at all? Are, is there no logical development? And of course, the idea that developments might have taken a different course is a very important one in historical consciousness of time. If, if things were just a little bit different at that moment there or there, perhaps the course of history might have been very different. And that, of course, has been also studied by the British uh, philosopher Butterfield in his famous book, The Big Interpretation of History. I don't know if you have you heard about that. It is the sort of criticism of English history as, you know, the, the, the logical line starting from the Magna Carta to, to the Bill of Rights uh, to uh, parliamentary democracy in the 19th century, just as if this Magna Carta was already, you know, the primitive root of 19th century democracy, which Buster uh, says it was not, of course, because the Magna Carta was a medieval thing. Uh, so the course of history might have been different. <clears throat> the second uh, major development is the one of that, uh, of, uh, the insight of, of, of the historical narratives, the narrativism, which uh, emerged in the second half of the 20th century. And it follows actually a bit from the first one. If there is a fundamental difference an unsurmountable distance between the past and the present, it follows that the accounts, the narrations, the images, the books, the texts that we have, it follows that accounts about the past are not only representing the past they describe, but also the period in which they were written. This is a very important addition to that you know, 19th century history, which was by someone like uh, Ranke, who said, I'm only interested in, in describing wie es eigentlich gewesen, and, but of course that's not, in, that's not possible. So these people say it's not possible. But you, can, you cannot say that something written in the 19th century doesn't bear the stamp of the 19th century as well as 
uh, uh, the stamp of what it, uh, what it describes. And then the question is, what is truth in historical narrations, if that is true? If it is true that a 19th century picture of the past doesn't only represent the past, but also the 19th century, where is truth in that kind of image? That is a very fundamental question in the philosophy of history. Uh, the Dutch philosopher Anker Smit says the truth is in their scope. So the more, the wider the scope of an image, the more things fit into uh, an image, the, the, the truer it is. So its scope and its coherence with other known facts. But of course, that's a bit of a circle of uh, reasoning because you have to start somewhere. The French philosopher Ricoeur uh, presents uh, three mediators between past and present. And that's, I think, is a very interesting approach because the, the question is how can you present truth about something that is gone, about something that doesn't exist, and if the, the thing that you write also represents your own time. And then Ricoeur refers to the, the, the calendar, chronology, uh, generations and relics. Uh, the generations and relics create evidence and generations are, of course, it's, it's, it's talking to people from other times, of course. And the relics, that, that is the things that we still have from other times. They create evidence. And together with chronology, it, uh, it is a sort of guarantee for the truthfulness of narrations. You have to see these as a, as a bridge between times. How can we bridge the distance between times? Well, why is chronology a way of doing that? Chronology is a, a way of, of, of presenting time as one coherent system. Chronology covers everything from the very distant past to, to the present. So it creates a coherence between the past and the present. And evidence also does that. Um, Truthfulness of narrations from the coherence. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about Riesling's Triftigkeit. Uh, he has a, another three uh, theories about why narrations are truthful. Uh, and empirical Triftigkeit, uh, normative, and what's the third one? I forget it. Huh? Narrative and no. Yeah, but but that is of course that's a bit double, but yes, <laughs> narrative fifty count, yes, uh, plausibility, isn't it? To, to, to translate fifty count, you could say narrative. Yeah. Okay, so we have another three concepts now. We have chronology, we have evidence, and we have narration. Chronology bridges the gap between past and present because there is one overarching time frame. Evidence bridges the gap between past and present because it existed in the past but still exists in the present. Now, we know that it existed in the past. That's, that's important. And narration bridges the gap because it tries to truthfully represent another time while inherently belonging to the time in which it was written. Actually, is that that is true for all of these three? All of these three belong to the past as well as the present. Evidence belongs to the past as well as the present. Chronology belongs to the past as well as the present, and narration also. So, I have arrived at six concepts of historical thinking about time, and I will now try to discuss why they are so difficult and unnatural to learn. And to be able to do that, I refer to a research that has been done by a lot of people researching teaching history, arriving actually at a similar conclusion. The six concepts are anachronism, distance, contingency, chronology, evidence, and narration. 
And the question is, why are they so difficult? Why are they so unnatural? Why are, so, why are they so difficult to sustain, as, as Oakeshott said? And uh, why are you so easily susceptible to relapse into another occupation and not refer to these six? Now we will come closer to the daily practice in school classes. Anachronism. Features of one period must be distinguished sharply from those of others. Why is it unnatural? It's unnatural because it requires what psychologists call temporal decentering. And temporal decentering means that you have to take the effort of not taking your own moment in time as the self evident point of looking upon things. You have to try to move into uh, to another position in time, which is extremely difficult. A lot of students, I'm now talking about students in the classroom, a lot of students in the classroom have a lot of difficulty of performing temporal dysentery. The second reason is that people rather look for similarities than differences. People like to recognize things that are uh, familiar. The most popular things in museums are those that people seem to like. Why? Oh, I can see what that is. It looks like this or it looks like that. But if you see something that is completely incomprehensible, something that is very alien, then you say, like, mm, I don't know what this is. Um, so, no. It doesn't attract your attention. You, you, you like to be you like to recognize things. You like to see people like us, humans like us. But of course, the people in the class were not like us. And it's difficult to measure them in that way. And then the third one, and of course, I think that you, all of you that are in classrooms will recognize that there is a strong, strong inclination among students to judge the class from the perspective of the present. And there is. It's, it's very difficult not to do that. So anachronism is a difficult one. Um, distance is unnatural because there is a tendency to look for identities. There is a tendency to look for weak groups. It's, it's striking how much in history school books, for instance, also in the history curriculum, is based on this we story. As soon as you, probably as you in Germany talk about German history, I think teachers will, perhaps not even on purpose, but just because it happens to them, will say we were like this in the past, or we were like that in the past. But, but it wasn't us, of course. It was our ancestors of centuries ago, or perhaps I often say to to my students, actually there is probably more similarity between present-day French, German, Dutch, Belgian people than between Dutch people from now and Dutch people from the 17th century. So if we say that, if we do not talk about we Europeans as we are now, why do we talk about we Dutch when we talk about people from the 17th century which were completely different from us? But still, we do that. We, we want to do that. We want to look for an identity in the past. And it's very difficult to get, to, to sort of discipline yourself into not doing that, or into trying to not do that and say, like, let's, let's just imagine that there is not this weak connection. What does history look like in that case? Um, recognizable stories from the past are more popular than complicated representations. For instance, if you want to uh, deal with uh, the origins of an economic crisis, that is far less popular than uh, talking about the daily life of uh, the farmers or whatever. And so people do not like complicated and abstract stories. People like recognizable stories. I'm talking about students in the classroom, but it's actually true for a lot of people. People, that's the one that I talked 
because you'll be foreign, but it's also true in this respect. Um, seeing the past, the contingency thing. Developments in the past do not result logically from each other, they are largely coincidental. Why is that unnatural? Because we would like to explain the past. If you do uh, history lessons, I think what you very often do is stress the connections between causes and consequences. Say, okay, this, these were the causes and these were the consequences. It, it's logical that this happened, isn't it? Because look at the conditions before. That's what we do. And therefore, it is difficult to see the past as something that is more or less coincidental. My famous example in this respect is actually the uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall in uh, 1989. When it happened, I think it was more or less like a surprise, wasn't it? I mean, how many people, how many people said one or two years before that happened? How many people then said this is going to happen in one or two years? I cannot remember anyone doing that. But after it happens, people start explaining why it happened. And then, of course, we know the causes. But if these causes would have been so obvious, why couldn't we uh, prophesy that it would happen? The causes were probably not that obvious. But, but still, we want to make sense of the story, and therefore we do this. We want to explain th why things were have developed as they have developed. A strong inclination towards causation. We want to know why things happened. And of course, there is a lack of interest in unrealized possibilities. Uh, we always we, we leave the unrealized possibilities are easily left out out of the story. And we, we concentrate on what actually happened, and we do not concentrate on what didn't happen, but could have happened. Although that is a very, very constructive way of dealing with history, actually, counterfactual history. And another thing is uh, the sort of logic in our heads that big events must have had big causes. So if something big happens, we start to look for big causes. But how much distortion is there in that activity? Uh, chronology is unnatural. I maintain that it's, it is unnatural because our cyclic daily time is more self-evident. It's difficult. The, cal the calendar is really difficult. If you want to remember things from your own life, for instance, try to do that. In what year actually happened this? Or in what year was that? It's very difficult to remember that. Of course, you remember the circumstances. You remember perhaps the details of an event. But if you have to remember uh, who, was the, who was the German chancellor in the year of my marriage, that's a difficult one. Because then you have to start calculating. And then you have to say, like, OK, what's the year of my marriage? And what's the periods of these chances? Okay, oh, it must have been that one. So that is, that is an unnatural way of doing it. Chronology is a very strange way of dealing with time, but we need it. Remembering dates and imagining durations has proven to be difficult. I mean, there's a lot of research among students that shows that even if we think that it is easy, it is really not that easy. Although it, it, it looks very simple, it's not. And, and besides, students hate to remember dates, right? Why do they hate it? Why do they hate it so much? Perhaps because it's unnatural. Uh, this uh, is also true. The framework of periods is not easily remembered. For instance, if you ask someone, if this, uh, this is a quote from an interview of someone in the street, and say, so, in what century did this happen? In what century did that happen? And then this person answered with, which centuries actually did exist? You know, I have no idea. What kind of centuries do, are there? So it, that is really not so easy, if, unless you study it. Uh, normally people do not do that. Evidence. Evidence is 
problematic because it is difficult to see evidence in its correct context. The dual character of evidence belonging to the past but being used now is problematic because students tend to either take evidence for granted this is, a, this is a, a, a story by someone who was there, so it's true. So this must be the history. So take it for granted, that's it. Or they discard it as unreliable, but as soon as it is unreliable, I don't know if that happens in Austrian or classrooms too, but in ours it does. This is an unreliable source. Okay, so I'm not going to read it. But in an unreliable source, there can be a lot of information. So, how truth can result from a present handling of evidence, which is authentic material from the past, authentic material has the image of being authoritative, but still, although it is authentic and authoritative, it is still us that have to handle it, and then result into something like historical truth. And that is extremely difficult for students, absolutely <laughs> very difficult to realize how this functions. The same is true for this one, for the narration. If the, why, why, why is narration such a difficult thing? Because students would imagine that if things happened in the past as they did and cannot be changed afterwards, it seems natural to suppose that there's also only one correct representation. It's, it's very natural to assume that. And of course, things in the past cannot be changed. This is something that, that's the, that's the problem of this. Can you change the past? Of course you cannot change the past, because the past is the past. But still there are numerous narrations which are all true. It is unnatural to distinguish history from the past, but you have to do it. History is not the same as the past. It's difficult to imagine how there can be an endless variety of representations of the past while they all represent aspects of truth and still there is no definite truth and there is no definite narration. Those are the, th uh, until here, we could say that for all of this, what I have said here, there is enough proof to say that this is really true of a lot of students in classrooms. Now the question is, why should we take every effort to combat it and to, to make them think in this very unnatural way about time? Why do we have to do that? And why is it so important? And that is actually not something based on research, but it's actually based on hypothetical uh, reasoning and of course open to criticism from your side. But these are might be possible yields of teaching these concepts. Anachronism. What is a potential societal yield? yield? The past should not be judged and interpreted from present perspectives or serve present political societal purposes in a straightforward or manner. I think all of us, many of us will agree about that. Simple parallels and lines for past to present should be avoided. For example, this kind of lines are some are things that we actually should avoid in history lessons. Even if always being oppressed by men, colonialism was outright exploitation, therefore assumed oppressed and feelings of superiority have always been inherently racist. Those things are too simplistic. They do not take the past seriously and they just draw lines in ways that do not uh, do not consider the laws of anachronism. Historical distance. It was that I've already talked about these we groups. Uh, and if we uh, could avoid talking about these we groups, what kind of yields could there be? For instance, in, in multicultural societies like ours, uh, there is a tendency to talk about a lot of different groups in society which all have their own history. And then, of course, it's we, and them, and us, and we do it like this, and you do it like that, etc. In multicultural societies, I would say, not thrusting upon each of the groups their own identity, but instead opening up a free and open debate about cultural heritage and cultural exchange. People have the right to, to choose for themselves, is my 
uh, conviction. And you shouldn't say, okay, you are from there, so that is your past. No. Everybody can deal with the past in his or her, or her own way. In situations with diverse opposed historical claims, a more open approach to history in search of a more distantiated common ground could perhaps create new opportunities for dialogue. For instance, what if the Jews and Arabs did not approach history from the, their diverse we perspectives? What if? What if they tried to study the history in a distant way? What if they didn't say, like, we established this state here and you established... But if perhaps people would say, okay, 50, 60, 70 years ago, my ancestors have done this. But I haven't done it, but my ancestors have done it. What is the consequence of today of what my ancestors have done? Not we, but my ancestors. For instance, I have tried it in Israel to pick up from it was early to the early <coughs> Anyway, I thought perhaps that is, a, that is a way to solve the problem. What if the slavery past were not approached from a white black dichotomy, as is being done now in the Netherlands a lot? I don't know if it's so, such a hot thing, thing in Germany, but it is in, in the Netherlands. And there's a lot of we and you talking about a white and black history. While if we did this from a more distantiated point of view, perhaps we could talk to each other in a much more sensible way. Um, contingency. The present is not the self-evident and only possible result of the development. So if you, if you take that as a, an important point of departure, it, start, it, it will stimulate thinking about alternatives. alternatives. Things are not automatically the way they are, they might have been different, and so they could be different also in the future. The future will not be predict the predictable result of the present. So, there, so it opens up an open debate about the future. And of course thinking about counterfactuals will uh, uh, create a lot of opportunities there. Um, I always think that future predictions are, a lot of, uh, are, are totalitarian. A lot of people uh, dictate us like this is waiting for us in the future, that is waiting for us in the future, but nothing is waiting for us in the future. Actually, completely nothing. The future is open, and we can make it to a certain extent. Uh, chronology, uh, societal yields, yields might be getting the facts right. Uh, chronology is a guidepost and delineator of historical narratives. It means that anything does not know, you have to respect certain laws, that certain things happen first and then after that, that etc., etc. And of course, it can serve uh, the, the uh, goal of correction of popular images. Um, I will, I, I'm going to make it a bit, a, this a bit speedier. This is an interesting one, but I will not do that. How much fact-free politics is, is based on historically unsound interpretations of past and present, disregarding the rules of chronology and evidence, I think, a lot. And for evidence, it's actually the same thing. Uh, yeah, evidence, see evidence in its context. Deal with authenticity and authority in search of historical truth. There's not one truth, and therefore knowledge of society is open to debate. Same one. Narration, the last one. The past, though unalterable, cannot have a fixed grip on the present because the past does not exist. The only thing we have is history, which is not the same as the past. And multiple interpretations may all represent truth. There is not one truth, etc. So it is important to understand this. How much would society benefit from the inside? But there is not one with historical truth about the role of victors and defeated in, for instance, in the world wars, but in the many other wars as well. Conclusion. Open societies, democracy, and historical consciousness of time mutually depend on each other. History cannot flourish in an unfree society. I think all of us agree on that. But the other one, a free society cannot flourish without history. If that's something that people do not very often, uh, that's something that you do not hear very often. 
Historical ways of thinking about towns are unnatural, do not rise spontaneously, therefore we need to teach history, this historical consciousness, and we need to teach those six concepts. And that has important consequences for the kind of history that we teach. Closed narrative, logical coherences between cause and consequences, group identities based on weak perspectives do, should be avoided, and history teaching should stress the dual nature of evidence and the nature of historical narrations as not the past, but a truthful representation of past. That is a very uh, short uh, summary, summar summarization of uh, what I'm trying to do. Uh, explain to you. If you want to read more uh, about this, you can of course read uh, that book that I have written, but also the story that I have now told, the, 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 the lecture that I've uh, been trying to do, is already uh, uh, in a, an article, a uh, concept article, and I have sent it to, uh, to Europe. Um, but the second version is now uh, submitted to the Journal of Curriculum Studies and it will hopefully be published uh, this summer in that journal so that you can reread the whole story and uh, some more of that in, perhaps in that book. Thank you very much. I don't know if you know that name from Stanford University and he has uh, written a book uh, under the title of Historical Thinking and Other Unnatural Acts. Oh. And that, that book has become very, very popular, etc. But actually, I agree with you that it shouldn't be the, the word unnatural is, is not the, the most ideal word. I, if you, I, no, I actually, I want to say there are spontaneous, no, let's put that in. Everyone has a consciousness of time. Every human being has a consciousness of time. There's no doubt about that. Every human being has images of the past, the present, and the future. The question is, what kind of images are there? There are the, there are the images that, that emerge spontaneously, and there are the images that do not emerge spontaneously, but can only be the result of, of study. That is actually what I wanted to say. And I agree with you that the word unnatural is, is not the best word. Peter, it's, it's Weinberg's fault. Well, just, as <laughs> that, uh, just as a comment on that, I mean, spontaneous concepts, so-called spontaneous concepts have to be learned as well, and so there are hugely complex cyclical concepts of time, the determination of Easter or Ramadan. Yeah. Or something. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not the question that's, that's, that I want to true. ask, though, because I have sort of already asked it. Uh, the other question is, uh, coming back to the point about democracy, I mean, I very much agree with you that the fundamental experience of change uh, is, is an important one. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't, if I were provocative, I would ask you whether um, 19th century Prussia was a, was a free society, but uh, I would rather ask you, how would you, do you want to go about establishing the link methodologically? How do you want to do it? Um, you said you were trying to study the connection between the historical time and democracy. How do you do that? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's a good one. Uh, uh, <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> the, the only thing that uh, only thing that I have done, and that I, I agree with you that that is to a certain extent defective, is is observe the reality that this way of thinking emerged in the same kind of societies in which also uh, thoughts about democracy emerged. And my my question is: Is it a coincidence? Is it a pure coincidence? <laughs> And how do you test my, the how do you test it? That <laughs> uh, by exploring the consequences of that uh, point of departure, and exploring uh, the, the the details of um, that historical way of thinking, and in, in in what respect does it connect to ways of thinking that are also important for uh, democracy? But sure, there should be. Uh, it, it's that, that you are absolutely right. That question is a, a very fundamental one and uh, cannot be so easily uh, disregarded. I, uh, I agree. With that. Uh, 
Your Highness, I fear that, and I regret deeply that this will be the last question, and all the other questions we should discuss in the Univaza, the, the center of uh, the restaurant here in the university, with uh, this, uh, after our Thank you very much for this lecture. Uh, a few minutes ago, you said the future is open, nothing is waiting. Are you sure? Sorry? The future is open yeah. and nothing is waiting. Nothing is waiting. Are you sure? Why yeah. not? Because if that would be true, we, there would be no need for historical thinking. Because in the religion's understanding of historical thinking, it is whether it complete coincidence, not completely uh, predictable. It's something in the middle. Absolutely. So, uh, uh, as I, uh, when I say nothing is waiting, it means that nothing is, let, let's say nothing is established as a fact that is waiting for us. Yes. But of course there are all options, there are possibilities, and they are of course connected to what happened in the past. And probably yeah. developments. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, nothing is waiting for us. Uh, okay, I sometimes like to exaggerate things. Uh, but I, I strongly dislike the people who can say, like, in 10 years from now, the world will look like this, 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 this. So we have to prepare for it. Uh, we have to prepare for something that I have established as your future. That's something that I do not like. So that's why I said that. I totally agree with you in that point. But we have to prepare for climate change, for example. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the differentiation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. But but even even in that respect, things are not fixed. Things are not fixed, and and are open for discussion and open for debate. And there are no laws in that respect. So I think it is the is the the result of historical thinking that we are much more open towards the future than people who might think less historically. That's actually the point that I want to make. Okay. Thank you very much. We continue our discussion in the Ivaza. All of you who want to come with us, do it. Thank you very much, Ari, for that inspiring talk. Thank you. Thank you.